So good morning or good afternoon all. This is uh, Denis Leclerc from uh, Ecotech Quebec, uh, CEO of Ecotech Quebec. It's the clean tech cluster uh, based in Montreal. So this explains my accent. I'm a, my mother tongue is French, so that's why uh, please, uh, if you can cope with my English accent. So welcome to this first clean conversation organized by Solar Impulse and International Clean Tech Network. Uh, so we're pleased to have you here today. Um, the, the objective is to have a conversation, not presentations. We, we want to have a presentation about the clean recovery. So global response for post-COVID in order to have a green recovery. So I'm very pleased to have three experts, three experts located in three regions representing three organizations, the local organization, but also uh, a, a more global associations. So uh, we have uh, Bertrand Picard, based in Lausanne. Bonjour, Bertrand. Bertrand is the chairman of Solar Impulse Foundation. We have also uh, Mike Maltke. Mike is uh, based in uh, Cape Town, and he's the CEO of uh, Green Cape. And we have also uh, Janet Jackson. She's uh, based in Vancouver, Canada, and she's the CEO of Foresight. So let me, when I said uh, at the beginning, three organizations there, they have their organization, but also they're part of a global association. Of course, Bertrand Picard, it's the Solar Impulse Foundations and the World, uh, uh, the World Alliance for Efficient Solutions. Uh, Mike is the chairman of International Clean Tech Network, and Janet Jackson is vice chair of Canada Clean Tech Alliance. So today, pretty easy. Uh, uh, we want to, uh, of course, uh, uh, discuss this recovery. We need you. We need your. Uh, we need your questions. So don't be shy to ask questions. There's a, a slide explaining how you can ask questions. I guess that you now, from the beginning of COVID, you know how to use uh, this app to ask questions. So short questions, short answers, and um, and and it, it, it's very interesting because we will have the opportunity to see similarities, to see differences from three regions, uh, Europe, Africa, North America. And you'll see there is no uh, magic recipe. There is no silver bullet approach. So that's why we want to uh, have this type of discussion and collaboration to speed up for a sustainable, resilient, and innovative uh, recovery. So first step is a round table. Roundtable for panelists. So I'll ask uh, each panelist to introduce themselves and say a few words, uh, three, four minutes, say a few words about what they're going through with, uh, right now in terms of the COVID, how do you see the green economy in a nutshell. So let's start with uh, Bertrand. Bertrand, bonjour. Hello, bonjour Denis. Hello to everyone. So I'm Bertrand Picard, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm an explorer, I'm the chairman of the Solar Impulse Foundation, and after the success of the flight of the solar-powered airplane around the world, we have launched now a challenge of um, selecting and labeling 1,000 solutions that can protect the environment in a financially profitable way. And we have a partnership with ICN in order to give the possibility to all the members of ICN uh, to submit the solution, to receive the label, and to be pushed, to be promoted toward investors, 
governments, big industries, big corporations, and, and so on. So this is why I'm speaking to you right now. The, the question about the clean re recovery. I think we have to be really clear. With the COVID-19 virus, there are millions of people, millions, dozens of millions of people who are suffering from an economical recession. It's even a crash. They lost their job. Some people have lost everything they have, lost their house. Uh, it's a disastrous situation implying a lot of suffering. So when we tell these people, we have to put environment, climate change, fighting pollution, first, these people will never understand. For them, it's life-threatening on the short term. So climate change, they, it's not the moment to speak of climate change to them. It's the moment to speak of economic recovery. And the question is, how can the economic recovery be fast and complete? And I think the only way for an economic recovery to happen is, by the way, to be clean, to be green. Because there are billions, trillions of dollars and euros who are flooding the market now to help the companies to recover and to hire the people again and increase employment. If this money goes to the old economy, that means to the economy that is inefficient, that is polluting, that is destroying the environment, it will not work. It will not work just because the people are fed up of this type of old technologies. It's too expensive. It's too expensive today to have a thermal engine car. It's too expensive to have a badly insulated house that needs too much cooling or heating. It is too expensive to waste half of the energy, half of the food, half of the natural resources. All this belongs to the old world, a world that was unrespectful for the environment, unrespectful for life, unrespectful for animals and for humans. It's a world that was fragile, unstable, and unfair. If we go back to it, there will be no recovery. We will lose trillions of dollars for absolutely nothing. But if these trillions of dollars are given with conditions, conditions about new behaviors, about new markets to be created, about being more efficient, imagine how many jobs can be created, how much profit can be done for the uh, industry. If we were to replace all the old, outdated, inefficient, and polluting systems and infrastructures by modern and clean and efficient ones. It would be a complete modernization of the country. And it pays by itself, or it pays for itself, because it's profitable. All these trillions of dollars can be used to build this modern world that is so efficient that then the money can be reimbursed, and you still make profit. So when we speak of recovery, of economic re recovery, it can only be clean and green, otherwise it will never happen. And this is what we have to explain. Excellent, uh, Bertrand. It reminds me, uh, I found a, a quote uh, over the weekend. It's the deputy prime minister of Spain. She said, the recovery should be green or it will not be a recovery it will just be a shortcut into the kind of problems we are facing right now. So that's exactly uh, your point. Thank you, uh, Bertrand. Now let's go to Africa, Mike. Thanks, thanks very much, Denis, and thank you very much, uh, Bertrand. Um, I have two hats here uh, this afternoon in, in South Africa. The first is I'm the chair of the International Clean Tech Network. Um, the ICN is a group of world-leading clusters that collectively represent several thousand uh, companies, academics, uh, government officials that are involved in the promotion and execution of projects and programs in, in the green technology space. Um, the ICN has got representation on, on four continents, North America, South America, Africa, and, and Europe. Um, and the team is very, is very proud to be working with Bertrand and the Solar Impulse Foundation to identify uh, credible, profitable solutions for the green economy. 
The second hat that I wear is um, I'm the CEO of Green Cape. Green Cape is a cluster here in Cape Town in South Africa, um, and we do exactly that. We focus on uh, building with government, academics, and industry uh, credible, profitable, and economically viable green economy solutions. To give you a little bit of the context of, of South Africa before uh, the crisis with, uh, with COVID-19 hit us, um, as we came, I think everybody knows that Cape Town has just come out of a, a one in 500 year drought um, with a lot of prospect of a major city with four and a half million people uh, running out of water. Uh, this really brought into sharp focus the requirement for efficiency measures for forward planning to understand the impacts of climate change on how you design and build infrastructure. All of the infrastructure pre the drought was built at a one in 50 year level of assurance of supply, which turned out to be um, not sufficient for this new world that we're moving into with climate change. Similarly, in South Africa, there is uh, significant constraints in our energy and electricity systems. Um, our national utility has been unable to keep up with the demand for electricity, um, which has resulted in many days of something in South Africa called load shedding, which is effectively the system operates that can no longer meet the supply requirement and will on a rotational basis switch off areas uh, so you have no electricity in one area for two hours, in the next area for two hours, in the next area for four hours. Uh, that's had a dramatic impact in reducing our economic growth. Um, and then finally, in waste, uh, there's a huge drive towards banning organic waste from landfills in South Africa, which will create massive opportunity in, in what we do with those organic wastes. So before the crisis uh, arrived in, in South Africa, there were three big topics um, that, were, that were being focused on around how do we become a water resilient economy, um, how do we build out cost-effective green uh, renewable energy technologies to augment our um, failing energy systems or energy systems that were under a ton of pressure, and then how do we look for opportunities in waste management. Since the COVID-19 crisis has hit South Africa, those three topics have become even more the focus on how we build the society we want to see after the crisis. Um, our president, I think, as uh, as has happened in um, in North America and in Europe, has announced the stimulus package of of 500 billion rand, which is in the region of 35 billion dollars, um, to be able to respond to this crisis. And that comes in the term of uh, support for small businesses, support for the green economy, support for infrastructure-led growth. Um, and from our perspective, it's an extremely exciting time to be in green tech and clean tech. Uh, because these are the projects, the programs, and the solutions that are going to build the world that we all live in in 40 years' time. Thank you. I'm muted. You're muted. muted. I'm sorry now. So thank you, uh, Mike, for your remarks. Now turning to North America from uh, the Pacific Coast, Vancouver, Janet. Thank you. Thank you very much. So like my esteemed colleagues here, I too wear a few hats. Uh, I am an entrepreneur in clean tech turned CEO of a nonprofit that is very bullish on accelerating the growth of the clean tech ecosystem across Western Canada. And we do that through lots of different programs that engage SMEs, industry, investors, government, and knowledge centers, which are the five pillars that we believe need to come together to build clusters and create a framework that can really support um, the ecosystems. And as Denis mentioned, I'm also vice chair of the Canada Clean Tech Alliance. So there's, you know, Canada is a very big country. So it's very important that we find ways to connect the dots across our big country um, and respect sort of the nuances in each province, but also come together with that broader vision where Canada has the potential now to really double down on our efforts in a green economy. I think one of the most devastating things about this health turned economic crisis is clean tech was really gaining a lot of momentum uh, three, you know, two to three years before uh, the pandemic hit. And we're seeing, uh, we did surveys across the country to learn from the SMEs and the industry partners what they're seeing. And we're talking about 50% job losses, 50% loss of investment dollars. You know, the impact is, is absolutely devastating. But, but like, you know, Bertrand and, and Mike have, have outlined, you know, with all of this potential investment from government, uh, it's, a, it's 
kind of an automatic thought for all of us on the call that this has to be a green recovery, but we're definitely competing against some strong historical sectors that have been the foundation, especially in Canada, where I'm sure all of you are familiar that the, the oil and gas sector is a big part of what we do, as well as mining and forestry. And so, um, you know, with, with Denis and, and some of our colleagues here in Canada, we've had the privilege of being part of conversations with different levels of government to say, okay, what is the best approach here for uh, a recovery? And so the approach that we've taken is sort of twofold in our, in our feedback and our thinking. You know, at a macro level, it's, it's basically fundamental that every recovery package for industry have a requirement to some sustainability or green jobs element to it. And, you know, that's a bit, you know, tying into policy, which is not my bailiwick. I'm definitely more on the strategy and, and business development side. But, you know, and we've already seen that um, through some of the early programs that are being offered to the oil and gas sector and the mining sector, where they need to have um, a green element, sustainability reporting, and all of those metrics tied into their recovery packages, you know, moving, moving ahead. And then when we get into sort of more of the details by region and by sector, you know, it, it feels that there's this sense of urgency to get all jobs back, where I do think we need to take a little bit of pause and sit, think these need to be green jobs. They just shouldn't be any jobs because in the long term, those jobs will not be sustainable. And so some areas of interest to, to us are around infrastructure. There's going to be lots of infrastructure projects as a way to stimulate the economy, and we want to make sure that it's green infrastructure. Um, there's also uh, food security. I'm sure everyone's now thinking, okay, if the borders are shut, how do we have an ecosystem within Canada and within all of our regions that can support local economies? And we're almost calling that glocalization. I was on a panel the other day and someone called it glocalization. I thought that's great because we still need to be global. We need to be aware about, about the opportunities to collaborate and learn what, what is happening around the world. But we also have to bring, um, you know, think thoughtfully, you know, if we need supplies and materials, we need to be able to pr produce that for ourselves. So, you know, overall, you know, we fundamentally believe that as part of every, you know, recovery package, whether it's for industry or the SMEs, that there needs to be some sort of tie into green jobs, green investments, and uh, an overall transition to, to a clean economy. Oh, you're muted, Denis. I'm sorry. Okay, I won't touch my mic, Denis. <laughs> We're talking, uh, Janet, you raised a, a, a question about globalization, um, partnership, collaboration. Um, it, it seems that, uh, you know, while talking to many of our CEOs, uh, uh, it seems that the export, so exporting our clean technology will be very, very difficult over the next few years because of, of the pandemic. So. So then, uh, what, what's the benefit of uh, partnerships? So what's the benefit of uh, organizations like International Clean Tech Network, Solar Impulse Foundation, Canada Clean Tech Alliance, to speed up this innovation, not only locally, as we all saw, each government each country is focusing on buying local but clean technology is not local is global how do you see the importance of collaboration through organization like yours who wants to uh, to start talking bertrand i believe that as long as we remain amongst ourselves we will have no result because we are convinced that we are right, but nobody knows it. <laughs> Which means that we have to speak to the people who are not yet convinced. We need to speak to the industry, to the finance, to the economy, to the politics. We need to speak to all the people with their language, not our language. And their language is the language of being re-elected the language of job creation, the language of profit. And we have to show them how we can increase the job creation, the profit and the re-election by to go, going to a, to a green and clean recovery. Uh, in that sense, 
they are excellent ambassadors for that. It's the big corporations. I noticed, and I, I wrote a tribune that is currently on the website of the Financial Times. I wrote this tribune with 12 CEOs of big corporations like Nestle, LVMH, Air France, and so on. And they wrote, they signed that they commit to a clean recovery. They even asked to the governments to have much more ambitious energy policies and environmental targets. They ask it, and they say that the regulation has to push the people who resist in the direction of the clean recovery in order to put everyone on the same and equal play field. Because the only thing that big corporations hate is distortion of competitivity. And they don't like the uncertainty. So if there are clear regulations that really push the implementation of clean technologies, they will be happy. Even a, even a carbon tax, they will accept it as long as it is for everyone and as long as they can predict when it will be implemented, at which level, and they can integrate it in their business plan. So if you give them certitudes, so let's say certainties, they will accept it. So they can be our ambassadors because when they speak to the governments, the government listen maybe more than when we speak. So our role is to get these ambassadors, talk to the governments who make the regulations. So, so the role of Solar Impulse, one of the roles is to get those business leaders understanding the not only the situation but also the potential benefit of the green of green economy or greener economy and to influence government is that the yes. case okay okay exactly thank you and and, and mike uh, for international clean tech network what's the benefit for an innovative sme to be part of a cluster and then a, a cluster of clusters yeah, thanks. And and a, a lot of the, the thinking echoes what, what Bertrand was saying. But um, at, at the SME level, at the firm level, entering markets and entering supply chains of multinationals um, or entering new markets and looking for new market opportunities, that's a big challenge. Uh, being part of an international clean tech network allows you to have a safe and soft landing in other geographies. Um, the ICN has used something called the ICN Passport, which allows you to go and visit uh, ICN members, set up in their offices, they'll arrange meetings for you, they'll help you uh, to meet the sector that you're trying to enter. A lot of the thoughts that have been on, on top of my mind recently have been, how do we continue to trade like this uh, without the ability to travel? Um, and if you look at the extension of, uh, of the lockdown or quarantines that will likely be um, requirements for international travel, how do we continue to promote SMEs into the supply chain of large companies uh, without them being able to be face-to-face -to, -face to demonstrate their projects and technologies. And I think that uh, platforms like the ICN, uh, labels like the, the Thousand Solutions label, allows, cred uh, allows credibility of those SMEs uh, to make their pitches uh, to these uh, multinationals or, or government officials. And then just quickly to, to link on what Bertrand is saying is, how do you change the mindset of decision makers, whether that's in government or within, um, or within businesses? And often it boils down to one specific individual who's in the procurement or in the uh, in the policy unit or in the supply chain process that needs to understand the motivation for why they should take a little risk on a new thing. Um, and that new thing they can believe in, but they need either a policy lever um, or a, enough pressure from their society to take that risk to try something that they haven't tried before. It's very easy to order the exact same uh, uh, whole suppliers you've ordered every single year, it's much more difficult to switch to something clean or to switch to PV or to research batteries. How do you capacitate those decision makers with both the information on how to make their decisions and the solutions um, to make those decisions? And I think that's where these networks uh, unlock tremendous value. Um, and then the last thing that I'll say is we found it incredibly useful to bring someone who is in that position of making those risky decisions to try something new for the first time and to talk to a peer or a colleague in another organization. Uh, typically, this is in utilities and we'll bring the CEO of one utility to speak to the CEO of another utility and say, five years ago, I was in your seat. Um, I didn't know what to do. These are the decisions I've made. 
and these are the benefits from those decisions. And I think these networks really allow that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning and decision-making that can rapidly advance the, the clean tech agenda. Thanks for Mike. Uh, Janet, do you see the same thing with Canada Clean Tech Alliance? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, so I, I, we wear a few different hats. When we're supporting the SMEs, it's very important that we support them to tap into the best network that's suited for them based on the sector that they're serving, um, based on their, you know, the type of technology that they have, um, and ultimately the resources they're going to need to scale, you know, their their innovations. From an ecosystem perspective, one of the most important things we can do in tapping into networks like Canada Clean Tech Alliance and ICN is it's a checks and balance, right? Um, I think historically, if you look back to organizations that are over 100 years old, they have what they call not in-house. So if they don't develop the technology or the solution in-house, then they're not going to take a look at it. Those days are gone. We need to build on the best of the best and continue to transfer knowledge and information so that we can start to pool resources and focus efforts to help more people transition at a faster pace to a green economy, depending on what that looks like. And all the sectors are so different, right? Like clean tech is so broad. You know, here in BC, I would say, you know, our mining sector is pretty progressive. They're doing some really interesting things, but perhaps pulp and paper you know, they're just understanding innovation. So there's a whole education piece. And so the faster that we can connect folks like that into international networks to say, look at that pulp and paper company is doing in Norway, then there's there's this fast track learning so that people can understand like going clean is not risky. It's a, it's a smart business decision. And just the two things that I would also, you know, you know, you know just touch on is, it's really important that holistically, we also look at what's happening in other regions. It's been very exciting to see the work being done in Europe with the Green New Deal. And I think now is the time for Canada to look at that model and look at those activities and say, okay, what makes sense for us? It, it's not gonna be the same because we're different countries and we're built on different um, historical sectors. But at the same time, there's a framework there that works and there's an opportunity. And then from an organization's perspective, like Foresight, you know, I was so excited to be on this panel with Mike because the work that they're doing in, in Green Cape is so fascinating and the type of funding models and that, that they're they're tapping into the system to commercialize some of these technologies is really interesting. And I want to learn from that and bring that back to to our region. So um, it's yeah. got to be an open book. So that's that's a huge value for organizations, but there's also huge value for SMEs, innovative SMEs. What we're hearing from our companies is that, you know, they're looking for visibility to get recognition and recognition because they want to have a greater access to market and capital. So as a, the, the, there is a, a, a proverb from Africa, I, I think it's saying that, you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. So that's why clusters and, and regroupment uh, makes uh, uh, probably have a, a, a solid or procure a more solid uh, uh, benefit for companies for uh, to implement the few, uh, green recovery, but also to expand their market. Talking about expanding market, that's good. We all say this is good green economy. We all know it's good, but we need to influence, uh, Bertrand said so, we need to influence it, to influence uh, central organizations or major organizations or governments. And, and which one we should, uh, should, first of all, which organization should take the lead to convince um, the business sector, general sector to adopt clean technology and to accelerate the pace of, of green recovery. So, so you have a EU, we're talking about Canada, there's uh, also other types of agree, international agreements, but I want to hear from you in your regions, is who should who is taking the lead or who should take the lead in your region? Who wanna start, uh, Mike? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Ania. It's, it's a fascinating question, um, and I don't know that this holds across across the board. 
in South Africa, what we've seen is that the central government has taken a very strong leadership role in responding to the crisis. Um, they've introduced a system of, of lockdowns and measures and new legislation, um, and that's largely been done at, at the central level. Um, that central government has been supported by what is a loosely formed uh, cluster of business organizations. Um, at the moment, they're called Business for South Africa. It didn't exist before, uh, before the lockdown and before Corona, um, but it's made up of uh, the Black Business Council, uh, Afrikaans Business Council, various uh, business councils, um, Business Leadership for South Africa. And they have coordinated businesses' inputs into how government is trying to respond to this crisis. And they've done that on a sectoral basis. Um, so there's a lot of work around energy, a lot of work around infrastructure recovery um, that we're aware of, but there are similar work streams around health, around education, um, that, that perhaps uh, as Green Cape we're not as aware of. So yeah, certainly from the South African perspective, what we've seen is a, a reinforced uh, role for central government, um, and that business is playing a very uh, proactive um, role in advising that central government. We've also seen quite a lot of foundations being uh, and high wealth individuals making uh, staggering contributions uh, to SMEs and to to the economy. And um, there's there's something in the region of of three or four billion rand of basically family donations to to support the economy. So there's an entire system of funding that's that's been uh, developed around private donations uh, to support the rebuild program. But that's that's certainly the case from South Africa. And in Canada, Janet, who should take the lead? Yeah, no, I think it's really, you know, interesting. Uh, shout out to Denis because Quebec has definitely been uh, very progressive in policy and support for the clean tech sector. And then I would also compliment uh, Foresight having the opportunity to be working in BC because obviously in BC we have the Clean BC Roadmap, which is a path. Uh, it's basically a path to help industry and and uh, and sectors transition to to green economy, and that's also complemented by a very strong carbon tax. And so, I would say, out of all of Canada, uh, Quebec and uh, and BC have the most progressive governments in place with various policies, etc. With that said, you know, Forset as an organization, we also support Alberta, and in Alberta, um, if you haven't been following along, the price of oil is low. And, it, you know, based on our oil sands, it has to be a certain price for them to have the funding to to work on transitions and, and other you know investments in R&D and, and innovation. But there is the Clean Resource Innovation Network, CRIN. And that, and Bertrand, I've had the privilege of sitting with you on a, a panel recently as well. And, and the, the, the comment that we cannot alienate old sectors and, and oil and gas sectors and all of those organizations that are provide, have been providing energy to communities for many, many years, we cannot alienate them. We need to support their, their efforts. And at least in Western Canada, um, you know, those sectors have traditionally been the highest investors in clean energy and clean technologies. And so um, from a leadership perspective, I think, you know, Quebec and BC, but uh, we want to definitely balance that out with all of our colleagues across the country. And in Europe, Bertrand, I guess the EU should play a major role, or are they the only one? The EU is more ambitious than the national governments because they are not directly elected by the population, uh, at least when we speak of European Commission. And so they can be more ambitious. But I think to answer your question, Denis, we have to fight on all fronts. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can be a city, it can be a region, it can be a national government, it can be international governments, it can be institutions, it can be corporations, and don't forget the media. Mm -hmm. Because the, the politicians, they read the newspapers every day to know what people think and what, they ex what the people expect from them. So if we are very present in the media, they will read it. They will see it, and if the arguments are good, they might follow it. When you see what happens in France, it's, it's, it's fascinating. When you see that the Minister of the Economy and the Minister of Transport have requested Air France to become the cleanest airline in the world in exchange of the 
support, financial support for the recovery. It's very courageous. It's fantastic. Uh, Germany and Switzerland did not dare to do it. They gave no conditions to their airline, which is miserable. So obviously the lobbying was not done correctly, or let's say the advocacy, I prefer the word advocacy, uh, was not made correctly in, in Germany and even in Switzerland. In France, it was much better. And the President Emmanuel Macron uh, really would like to do something for the environment. But he, he told me once, he said, I cannot do it alone. I need the support of everybody to, to do it. So let's give the support and the media are a perfect way to give the support and the encouragement. It's a very good point. You know, this uh, using using the media, maybe the word using is not the appropriate word, but yeah, partnering with the media is really key. And I have, uh, I'm receiving questions and we did receive questions obviously before. Uh, Mike, you said the last time, uh, you know, I ask a question, you say it's a great question. I don't want to take the credit of those questions. It's coming from, uh, the the people registered in this uh, uh, in this conversation. I have the question about you know this is good. We we need to focus, convince, uh, use organizations on front of organization. But there is a huge amount of money that have been already spent uh, uh, to cope with the COVID. But where the money will come from for the green economy? Um, how can we, is there a way that we can leverage public money to get more private money? So to uh, uh, mobilize the private sector to invest in the green economy. Any clue? Just raise your hand. No, with, with pleasure. Um, you know, the, the money is artificial money. It is just given by the central banks to the companies in order for them to avoid being bankrupt. This money can either be given to avoid bankruptcy with no conditions, or it can be given with conditions that will make this industry more competitive in the future. And this is the question of the clean recovery. If you have a company, an, an, a car manufacturer, who is almost bankrupt, it's not normal to give the money for free and say, just build the dirty old cars that you did before. You need to say, we give this money, but you will now produce cars that will be more efficient that will use less gasoline and that will pollute less because we know it is possible. And for example, one of the solutions that has been labeled by the Solar Impulse Foundation comes from a British startup. Uh, it's a module that you install on the cars and it reduces the particles by 80%, 80%, and it reduces the fuel consumption by 20%. The car manufacturers refuse to use it. It could be a condition to get the money from the state to use this, this module and to install it on all the new cars. It costs 500 euros for an individual. For, for a company, it, could, it would cost 200 euros, maybe not, not even. So these are the examples where you see that the money that is anyway being printed to be put on the market has to be attributed to the companies who play the game of efficiency, protection of the environment, clean air, instead of the one who just go back to the past and continue polluting. Mm -hmm. Any type of uh, these conditions, Janet? Yeah, I mean, I think in Canada, perhaps they're taking a little bit more of a delayed response. All of the recovery to date, except for the few items I mentioned there for the oil and gas sector, have been just around um, Minim maintaining a minimum revenue for for people of all walks of life from all sectors. So they haven't really started to dive into the recovery packages yet. I think those announcements will be coming in the coming two to three weeks. A special task force has been assembled 
to provide direct feedback into the you know prime minister's office all around a green recovery so they definitely have the right folks at the table that are supporting this and this is also similarly my understanding happening in most provinces as well um especially in bc you know i have the privilege of being part of a uh, a, a group that's providing feedback on on what recovery will look like and how they're actually going to start to distribute the funds. So I think it's a little early to comment, but what we do know mm -hmm. is based on announcements from the Prime Minister and our premiers in most provinces is that green recovery is a priority for everyone. And, um, and so it's a matter of how, what are the details? And I think, Bertrand, there has been actually and we see a, a big conversation around electri electrification and and making sure that the electric uh, electrical infrastructure is there to to support large industry and so it, you know there's lots of moving parts it's some of it's we call it shovel worthy projects uh and then in, in, in other instances it's more just macro spending um to keep jobs going so i think we're still in a bit of a dynamic where we're not cer certain but it's top of mind Super, uh, thank you. And, and just uh, in, in Canada, they, they just announced a new um, measure called the Large Employer Energy Financing Facility. So it's LEAF. What is interesting is that the, those larger, large employer, they have to commit to respect, of course, collective bargaining agreements and protect workers and pensions and they have to uh, make sure that the, the employment tax and the econ economic activity remains in Canada but being said there's another line almost hidden somewhere in the press release saying that well in addition those company will be re required to commit to publish annually climate related disclosure reports consistent with the financial stability board's task force on climate related financial disclosure so what it means in plain english is they will need to say what they're doing to protect climate to fight climate change so we'll see how intense this will be but uh, I think it's a first step in the right direction if they're serious about uh, this aspect of uh, disclosing their uh, activities and, and efforts uh, to fight climate change. Mike, do you see the same thing in, in your region? Yeah, I think in, in South Africa, it was, it was in the context that I was trying to set right in the beginning is we arrived with, with a lot of infrastructure build out requirements. Um, and those infrastructure build-out requirements were already pointing quite strongly towards renewable energy, uh, smarter communication systems, uh, efficiency around water and, and waste management. Um, I think what we're seeing now in the in the emerging um, uh, in the emerging markets in, in South Africa is really an attempt to try to provide sufficient policy certainty to get private sector to to fund some of these infrastructure projects. Um, Maybe the other example that I'll have in mind, so, so specifically that's around energy. I mean, South Africa will have a very unique situation this month where we'll be in uh, stage three of lockdown, which is a certain level of how mobile you're allowed to be, and stage one of load shedding, which is uh, you have electricity. So you're at home, but how do you have, how much electricity do you have while you're at home? Um, so certainly from a renewable energy build out perspective, there's huge opportunity to leverage private, uh, private capital. Mm -hmm. There's also a little project that we've been working on with SMEs, uh, which is to take um, a grant allocation from our national treasury and to blend that with uh, private sector venture capital um, at sort of a rate of between four and five to one. So one part grant to five part private sector capital to encourage those um, private sector capital providers to invest in green SMEs to create green jobs. So. Uh, effectively, what we're trying to encourage the government to do is to use the grant incentive to buy a green job um, through the through existing financial markets to supply funding to SMEs. Um, and this is a model that we've worked on with, with a number of partners, the World Bank, um, UCT's Bertha Center, and, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Um, so we've got a pretty good team that's trying to use this to catalyze growth at the SME level um, in the green economy in South Africa. Um, we think that if this uh, 
Green Outcomes Fund, it, it's in its pilot phase now, so it's it's got a 600 million rand allocation. Um, if it can succeed in that pilot phase, it can really play a meaningful role in how SMEs recover in South Africa and also how we how we look to transitioning away from uh, from fossil fuels, particularly coal, in, in our energy systems. This is another example how important is recruitments like International Clean Tech Network, Solar Impulse, Canada Clean Tech Alliance, because we need to have these type of, I would say, experience um, measures that uh, and to see the impact and work uh, and, and learn from uh, those best practices and, and sharing them. So this is a, a, a good way of uh, uh, speeding up uh, the, the recovery, I would say sustainable recovery. I, we have a question, another question here that said, uh, uh, what are your top suggestions for changing society? towards a greener and responsible one. So what's your top suggestion? Of course, after the COVID, we're all shake. Uh, so what would be uh, the roadmap uh, to change the society uh, towards a greener one? Who wants to start? Janet. Yeah, I'm happy to comment here. What, an, uh, what a question. A uh, huge challenge ahead of us. I my gut instinct is to start with education because a lot of people, you know, I, I'm sure like you, you're at a dinner table with your friends and they're, you know, dental hygienists or you know, they're service providers or something, and you know, they say clean tech. What is that? How does that impact me? What does that look like? But we've seen the normalization of clean tech through um, electric vehicles and and other home rebates for LED lighting and things like that. So it's getting a little bit more personal. But ultimately, most people do change with some sort of financial incentive. So I'm not sure of what that would look like, but some sort of tax credit based on your carbon footprint per year could encourage people to be a little more hyper aware of all of the potential things that you can do to be part of the solution uh, on your day to day activities. That would be a high level comment for myself. Bertrand? I would change the wording. The wording we are using is not relevant. When we speak about climate change, we have no real concern about the people because it's too far away. We should speak about pollution because pollution is killing people today, not in 30 years. We should not speak about renewable energies as a goal. We should speak about cheap energy for all. We should not speak about clean tech as a goal in itself. Clean tech are a way, it's a tool to reach the goal of being efficient. And when we speak about uh, green recovery, I think we frighten everybody. We have to speak about profitable recovery, about the huge recovery, about the recovery for all. And the tool to do that is clean tech. But very often, we, we, we don't use the wording that is really motivating the people to, to go for this change. Interesting, uh, asked, uh, interesting aspect. Uh, how about you, Mike? It's a, it's a very tough answer to follow. Um, <laughs> in, in my mind, um, there's, there's really a choice between the system is failing and the system is failing to price externalities correctly um, so you can take two views on on how to address that is you can uh, try to destroy the system and rebuild a new system um, or you can try for incremental improvement of the existing system um, i think in the uh, in the climate fight we've seen both sides of that you've seen a lot of very passionate uh, organizations trying to dismantle and rebuild systems um, my organization uh, approaches this in more of an incremental uh, improvement sort of a way. Is how do we adjust behaviors today? How do we use um, levers and nudges to uh, to start to create, to put us onto the path where we land in the in the future that we would like to see? 
and, and certainly with with the clean recovery that that we're looking at here is the there is there is almost a requirement that some companies are going to fail now that the world will be different when we emerge from this um, and there's this moment or this window of opportunity to be able to direct those resources towards companies and programs that will create this world that puts us on the right path towards a, a sustainable future. Can I can I challenge one comment? Yeah. Um, and I know, so I think before COVID-19, I would have 100% agreed with the statement, but what we have seen through this pandemic is an unprecedented ability for people to actually take a step back, change what they're doing, change every activity, and for a common goal. And so I would almost say, I, I totally agree with the with your comment there, that an incremental is absolutely, but is there an opportunity now that we've seen how people can come together that can maybe give us a, a different path forward or an alternative, more aggressive path forward? Well, actually I have two questions. I'm gonna merge the two um, is, is about, okay, how, how do we do that in terms of expertise and jobs? Um, so what's the advice you would give to young professional looking to get involved in the circular economy and clean tech? So what's the advice? And the second one is how can we reskill the employees in well, it's written here in dirty industries, but let's say in, in energy and other type of industries, how can we reskill them to get into this world, uh, the circular economy and clean tech? Bertra. I think we can go to every decision maker. It can be a CEO of a small company or a big corporation or the mayor of the city or the president of a country with a list of all the technological solutions that are financially profitable. And we see which one are relevant in his case. Of course, in your, if you are in, the, in the Washington DC, a solar boat in the harbor is not very uh, relevant. Uh, something for the snow is not relevant. If you are in a Nordic country, it's going to be different as for the Sahara. But each region can find something relevant, at least 100 or 200 ideas that can be implemented. And then you pass a regulation in order to encourage all the parameters, all the factors that will make these solutions implementable. I give you an example. The goal is not to use all the clean techs in houses. But if you tell, now we want the houses to be better insulated because we have the materials to do it. And you put a regulation saying that all the new houses have to get a higher standard and all the old houses have to be renovated then you know exactly how to use the money. You know exactly which are the solutions because you search in the list what are the solutions that apply for that. And then you, you just do it. And because it is profitable, it pays for itself. So the money is not, is not lost and the people living in the house will have less uh, heating, uh, cooling or electricity cost at the end of the month. So you see it's a win-win-win. You have to go really sector by sector, solution by solution, and see, does it apply, yes or not? So, and this will create jobs, obviously, because, uh, you know, technologies are proven and we need to scale them. And, the, the you know, it's, um, and the cost follows the logic of all manufacturing. So, to more you produce, cheaper it gets. So. If it's that, this this will create uh, at the same time jobs and rescaling uh, uh, employees and also attracting new uh, young blood into the economic uh, or the green economy. Mike, do you see the same thing? 
Yeah, so th it's a very, again, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so we are thinking about how do you apply this to, to legacy industries or sunset industries, um, coal mining or uh, petrochemicals, um, as they begin to phase out or begin to come, become less, um, less competitive. And I think the, the sort of narratives that we are um, experimenting with are imagining the next generation. So if, if you are a coal miner today, it's quite unlikely that you would want your child to become a coal miner um, for their future. You would want the certainty that they have employment and that they're able to take care of themselves and they're able to take care of their families, um, but not necessarily that those are those that those are their working conditions. So if you can, if over time we can provide credible solutions um, for meaningful employment creation in the green economy, particularly in rural areas or in South Africa's context and low skill uh, environments, um, there is a opportunity to have kind of a labor absorbing green economy. Um, which I think will solve many of the issues that that the politicians are most anxious about is how do we how do we transition how do we bring people along with this transition? Um, certainly in, in the South African case, the economics is driving it. It's now cheaper to build new renewable energy than anything else by by quite a considerable distance. So it will happen with or without the justness of the transition. So how how do we bring humans with us? When you yeah, when you speak about coal mines, it's a really good example. Uh, I had a long meeting with the president of Poland, and it's clear that if you tell him to renounce to coal, he will kick you out of the office because Poland is living with coal. But if you do not attack coal and you offer a profitable alternative, for example, in Poland, it would be wind, on the north part of, of Poland, where wind power would be excellent. You don't touch coal, but you invest in wind industry. And very quickly, it will become more profitable than coal. And the people living in the coal mines will go work on the, on the wind industry. And de facto, you will reorient the industry in a, in a better situation. So I think the mistake we do far too often is to attack something right in front instead of just letting it disappear by itself because we put better alternatives. Jeanette, a quick but, uh, quick remark? Yeah, no, I'm just you know reflecting on you know how certain governments are a little higher risk in decision making than than others. And so, for example, in the Netherlands, you know they have you know tech. A top sector and they have very progressive decision making the politicians are not as penalized for making a decision one way or the other whereas in canada it's quite a different story there's a huge historical lobbying for the oil and gas sector and it's and I, it's rightly so they've been a foundational element of our financial success as a country but i do think i'm i'm extremely excited about my daughter's 13 and she's all she talks about is when i can drive i want an electric car when I, I don't want to use water, why is there so much packaging, you know? And so I'm, I'm, I'm excited that, that those are some of the indicators that the youth are, are thinking about it. But when it comes to sort of that middle demographic of workers, um, you know, it's specifically in the resource sector, a lot of those engineers and experts and, and specialists are very well positioned to bring their expertise to clean, to, 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 to scaling, um, some of our most transformative technologies, whether it's carbon capture and, and methane, you know, um, systems and clo you know, closed loop um, energy systems and things like that. So like we, we have them there. It's just someone has to make the decision that makes, like you said, Bertrand, it doesn't have to be, you know, a red flag on the sector, but it, that there has to be something that pushes it along and, exactly. and hopefully COVID-19 is, is that push. Thank you very much for your remarks. And uh, well, it's uh, just finishing our clean conversation, our first clean conversation. Uh, uh, I just want to remind the 100, 1,000, I'm sorry, solutions from Sauver and Paul. So for clean tech companies that would like to have this type of visibility, recognition, greater access to market and, and the capital, 
go to 1000, go to Salary Impulse Foundation and, and fill up the form to be identified as efficient solutions. And for the others, either for Canada, International Clean Tech Network, uh, companies, as we said earlier, stronger together. So if you can uh, be a member of those clusters, this will help accelerating the pace for a more sustainable, innovative, and resilient recovery. Thanks all. The next meeting, Thank next you. conversation will be June 10, and we will then focusing on greener cities. What should we be doing with cities? Thank you all, and uh, hope hope that uh, 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 this was useful for you. And uh, let's see each of us uh, in one week from now, June the 10th. Thank you all. Merci beaucoup. Goodbye. Goodbye, and thank you for thank this you. great collaboration with ICN. Thank you, Denis. À bientôt. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.